Before we jump into actually putting text or graphics on the page, we'd better stop and take a look at the various elements of the document window. Because whether you create a new document or open an already existing one, you're going to see the same things. I'm going to create a new document here by clicking the New Document button. You could do the same thing by going to the File menu and choosing New Document. When you do that, you get the New Document dialog box, and I'm going to cover these features in a later chapter. I'm just going to click OK here. And what we see here is the page, the first page of our document, sitting on a pasteboard. And the pasteboard is simply the scratch area around the document page. You can put stuff out there that you may use, you may not use, but only the stuff that shows up on the document page itself is going to be what prints or what gets exported to our PDF file. The document page is surrounded by this black line. That's the edge of the page itself. And inside the document page, you'll see these colored lines. And the pink one, the magenta line, is the margin guides. In this case, we can see the top and the bottom margin guides. They're left and right margin guides as well, but they're covered up by these purple lines. And these purple lines are column guides. In this case, this page simply has one column, one big wide column, and so there's only one set of purple guides that are sitting on top of the pink guides. At the top and the left of the document window, you'll have the rulers, and these rulers let you, of course, measure things on your page and measure your page itself. At the bottom left of the document window, you have various elements like the zoom control. This percentage down here, we're currently at 79.17%. I can select that and zoom back by typing in something else, let's say 60%, and I'll hit enter and we'll zoom back. This lets us see the document page smaller, more of the pasteboard, and this gray area above and below the pasteboard, which is sort of a no man's land. You can't really do anything with that. A little bit further over to the right in this lower left corner is the navigation area. And currently it says we're on page one. We're looking at page one. I can actually select that and let's say we had a five page document. I could type five and it would jump to page five as soon as I hit enter. In this case, I only have one page, so that won't do me any good. To the left and to the right, there are these arrow icons that let me move forward or backward a page, or to the first page, or to the last page. A little bit further over to the right, you'll see an area that currently says Never Saved. This is the area that interacts with Adobe's version queue. That's an advanced topic and outside the scope of this title. On the left side of the screen, you'll see the tool panel. And the tool panel gives you all the various tools that you're going to use to create objects on your page. As I select different tools in the tool panel, you'll notice that the control panel changes too. That's because the control panel is context driven. Depending on what you have selected on your page or what tool you have selected, it changes. And the control panel gives you information about the objects on your page and it lets you change those attributes like the size or the position or the formatting of those objects. Now on the far right side of the control panel, there's a button. And when you click this button, it takes you right to Adobe Bridge. That's Adobe's asset management software that lets you manage all of your text and your graphics and other files and so on. Below the Bridge button is where all of your panels live. Now if you've been using InDesign for a while, you're probably used to seeing these more as palettes. But in CS3, they changed them from palettes into panels. And panels, you simply open by clicking once on them and you can see the information, you can change whatever you want to change about your document, and click again, and it closes the panel. You're going to be spending a lot of time playing with these panels, uh, because that's where a lot of the power of InDesign is. We'll be covering that in the various chapters in this title. Now, there are many more panels in InDesign than appear here in this list. You can get all the panels by looking in the window menu. The window menu shows all the panels, all 41 of them in InDesign, and you can show them or hide them simply by selecting them from this menu. The next menu over is the help menu. And the help menu is often overlooked by new users and experienced users too, but there's lots of cool stuff here that you should pay attention to. The welcome screen gives you that welcome screen that we saw at the very beginning of this movie. Also, this lets you activate or deactivate your software, but the one that I like the most is this online support. And the online support launches your default web browser. It takes you right to Adobe's technical support web page. And the information changes there from time to time, and it's a good idea to check it out and and you know, maybe every month or two, just check it out and see what's new with InDesign so you can stay current. Now that you know your way around the document page, the document window, the panels, and so on, it's time to learn about navigation. Zooming in and out, changing pages, panning around your document, and that's just what we're going to cover in the next movie.
You won't get very far in InDesign just by staring at the first page of your document. No, you need to learn how to navigate the high seas, zooming, panning around, jumping from page to page, and that's just what I'm going to teach you right now. The first tool you need to know about is the zoom tool, which lets you zoom in, or if you hold on the Option or Alt key, zoom out. I like using the keyboard shortcuts for the zoom tool, it's just much more efficient. And the keyboard shortcut is Command Spacebar on the Mac or Control Spacebar on Windows. And when you hold that down and then click, you zoom in. To zoom out, you do a Command Option Spacebar on the Mac or Control Alt Spacebar on Windows, click and you zoom out. Now on the Mac, when you do a Command Spacebar, you may find that you open the Spotlight window. And if that happens, just go ahead and hold down the Spacebar first, so you sort of like Spacebar Command click, and that will zoom in instead. The tool right above it is the Hand tool, which lets you pan around your document just by clicking or dragging. The keyboard shortcut for the Hand tool is Option Spacebar on the Mac and Alt Spacebar on Windows. Now down at the bottom left corner of the document window, we have the zoom area where I can pick from a number of predefined zoom percentages for zooming in and out or just type the percentage I want. Let's say I zoom back to 50%. To the right of that, I have the control of specifying which page I want to see or picking a page out of a preset. This shows me all the pages in this document. I can even choose a master page, which is a topic I'll cover in a later chapter. By clicking on the right arrow here, I move to the next page. And if you click on the arrow with the line next to it, it takes you all the way to the last page of the document. You can also zoom in and out by using the View menu. And here in the View menu, you can see all the controls for zooming in and out, such as the keyboard shortcuts, uh, Command plus, Command minus, on Macintosh, or on Windows, it's Control plus, Control minus. Notice that here it actually shows an equal sign. The equal sign is the same key as the plus sign. It's just easier for me to remember plus or minus as opposed to equal and minus. We also have fit page in window or fit spread in window. And fit spread in window is very helpful. The command option zero on the Mac, control alt zero in Windows, because that takes the current spread and makes it fit right inside the current size of the window. One of the cool things about this is if I actually change the size of the window by dragging the window size, the page resizes as well. It'll always stay within the confines of the document window. There's two other places that you should know about in terms of navigation. One is the pages panel, which gives you a little thumbnail of each page or spread. That's new in CS3, and also lets you move from one page to the next. For example, if I double click on this 2-3 spread number, it takes me right to pages 2 and 3. The other panel that helps me navigate is found in the window menu, down under Object and Layout, and I choose Navigator. And the Navigator panel actually lets me move from spread to spread, or lets me zoom in on the current spread that I'm at. And when I'm zoomed in, I can actually move this little red rectangle around right to the area that I want to see. It's worth it to go over these navigation features a number of times and really get them down because these are the features you're going to use a hundred or even a thousand times each day. Now that we know the basics of navigating, it's time to learn a little bit about the rulers and the measurement systems inside InDesign. As scientists like to say, if you can measure it, it must be there. How do we measure things in InDesign? Measurements show up in a number of locations, including the control panel along the top of the page and the rulers. For example, this is an 8.5 by 11 inch page. And I can tell that because the upper left corner is right at the zero, zero point of my rulers. And we can see it's 8.5 inches wide by 11 inches tall. But what if you don't work in inches? What if you like millimeters or picas? No problem, we can change the measurements very easily. First way you could do that is by control clicking on the Macintosh with a one button mouse, or if you have a two button mouse, you simply right click and you see all the measurements that you can choose from. You can choose points, picas, inches, millimeters, and so on. Notice that I've changed the horizontal measurements separately from the vertical measurements. If I want to change both at the same time, new in CS3, I can right click or control click on the Mac, this little intersection of the two rulers, and I'll choose both of those. Now I'm looking at picas, both for the horizontal and the vertical measurements. Another place I can change my measurement settings is in the Preferences dialog box. On the Macintosh, I find Preferences under the InDesign menu. On Windows, the Preferences menu is under the Edit menu. I'll choose Units and Increments, 
which opens the preferences dialog box and I can change my setting here. I'll change it back to inches. When I click OK, the rulers once again update. Note that because a document was open when I made this change, it only applies to this particular document. If I wanted to change all new documents I create from now on, I would have to close all my documents and make that preference change while no documents were open. You can also find measurements in the Info panel. Whenever I select something on my page, the Info panel actually gives me information about that object, in this case, the position and the size of that object. But here's a secret feature that very few people know about. You can click on this little tiny triangle right here and that also lets you change your measurement system. InDesign is full of these hidden but useful features. That just makes it more rich and more fun to use. Most of InDesign's features live inside its panels, and there are a lot of panels in this program. And since you're going to be looking at these panels a lot, you really need to know how to manage them efficiently. So when you first open InDesign, you see all of these panels listed out along the right side of the screen, and they all live inside this thing called a dock. The dock is the darker gray area here. If you click on this double arrow, it turns that list into the actual panels where you can see all the features in them. But usually, I keep that minimized down to just seeing the icons and the titles. Then, if I want to see any specific panel, I just click on it and then click again to close it. That's typically how I work. Oftentimes, when you have a, a, a real limited screen real estate, you may even want to make this even more compact. And you can make that more compact by dragging the left side of the dock to the right until it snaps all the way to the side and you just see the icons itself. Now one of the problems with this icon view here is you cannot have more than one panel open at the same time. So here I've got the layers panel and if I want to open the swatches panel at the same time, it closes the layers panel. So if you want to have more than one panel open at the same time, you'll need to get it out of the dock and turn it into a floating panel. The way you do that is by dragging this little gray area at the top right out onto your page or screen. And when you do that, the whole group of panels turns into a floating group of panels. If I want to take just one panel out at a time, I can simply grab it and drag just that one panel out. And now just that one panel is floating out here. You can drag out a number of panels here, and you can even merge these together. I'm going to take this paragraph styles panel and drag it up until I see a bright blue line underneath the character styles panel. And now these become a single panel. So when I move that group, they both move at the same time. Now as you can see, it's very easy to start getting a very messy, cluttered workspace here to work with, but there's a couple tricks. If I drag this panel over to try and put it back into the dock, and I see a vertical blue line, that means that this panel is going to go into a new dock. It actually creates a new dock to the left of this dock. Now if I drag it a little bit further over to inside this dock, I actually see two different versions. Here it says put the panel into this panel grouping. Or if I drag it and drop it in between panels, it means make a new panel grouping inside the dock. Another way that you can clean up your clutter is by clicking on the minimize buttons in the title bar of a panel. If I click once, it minimizes a little bit. If I click again, it really minimizes. It makes it really tiny. Now I can move this whole group over to the side and only access it when I need to. I'll do the same thing over here. There's one more thing you need to know about panels, and that is they almost always have a menu. This little icon here means that there are more features that are not immediately visible that have to do with this particular panel. So for example, in the swatches panel, click on the menu and I get all kinds of features having to do with swatches, color swatches. Positioning your panels is all about finding what you need as easily as possible, but you'll quickly find you need different panels open at different times. When you're working with text, you'll need certain panels open, and you'll need different panels open when you're working with color. That's where workspaces come in, and that's what we're going to cover in the next movie.